Welcome again, everyone, to another episode of the Philosophy of Art and Science. Today, I am joined by Chanter or Cantor Daniel. Good evening, Daniel. Good evening, Hanak. How are you doing? I'm doing well, doing well. Glory to God. Glory to the Panto Kratar. <laughs> Haven't seen you in four days. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It was a pleasure um, to have you visit our our parish in lovely South Central Los Angeles. Um, in order to kind of uh, build it up, I think you had a, a great moment with uh, one of our fathers, Father Father Thomas, and you're like, mm -hmm. man, that would be quite a light-skinned Ethiopian if that's an Ethiopian. <laughs> and I don't think he's an Egyptian. Some people have thought he was Egyptian or... Oh or russian they didn't they didn't know and uh he's had some great moments because he takes the met uh the metropolis or the he takes the bus all over the place and uh he's had instances with ethiopians where he tells them no i'm an ethiopian monk and they just like look at him and they're like are you sure he's like yeah i'm pretty sure <laughs> um but uh, <laughs> why, why don't you tell the audience how you first heard of oriental Orthodox Christianity or Miaphysite Christianity or Afroasiatic Christianity, because I think more often than not, we're simply not heard of. I even had a, a friend who's been on this channel recently was asking me about the whole Monophysite thing, and I need to go and help uh, clarify that for him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, uh, it's either introduced through kind of a British lens in history or an American lens, and I'm just curious how you, how you first heard of our communion and how you decided it was for you. Yeah. Well, w w when I first heard of, of the Oriental Orthodox churches was a long time before I would have really considered becoming Oriental Orthodox. Uh, it, when, when I was a child and um, kind of my spiritual journey is that I grew up fundamentalist Baptist and um, got, got burned from that. And so the first couple of years that I was an adult, I was just kind of off on my own, kind of basically into the Messianic movement stuff. Um, but when I was a child, I first heard of the, of the Coptic church. And, you know, probably didn't have the best understanding, but knew that they were a little different uh, than the Eastern Orthodox I met with an Eastern Orthodox priest when I was like 15, not, wow. not inquiring into it, just kind of curious to meet them. That's and pretty early he, on. That's earlier on than I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was pretty early on. And, and I mean, there was no consideration in my mind at that point of becoming any kind of, of Orthodox or Catholic. Um, but I wanted to, to still check in and, and see what it was about. And, and so he kind of explained to me that there was this council called Chalcedon, and so the Oriental Orthodox churches had rejected it, and the Eastern Orthodox had accepted it. So I had that basic concept in my mind from then on. Um, and, and the priest at that time was very ecumenical. He's actually become less ecumenical over the years. Um, <laughs> but it, when I... Uh, when I was about 20 and kind of very into Saturday Sabbath and following the um, Old Testament dietary laws and things like that, I became a little aware of the, of the Ethiopians because I saw this Ethiopian church nearby where I was living. And I, I looked them up a little and, and I thought about going and checking into it because of some of those similarities that they had, but I never actually did. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know how differently things would have turned out if I'd become uh, Oriental Orthodox eight years before I did, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny because you talk about these Judaizing features and mm -hmm. it's one of the, the biggest controversies. I've spoken about it a few times on this channel with, with different guests, but it's something people misunderstand across the centuries. And mm -hmm. it's um, it's a weird confluence of things that it's it's hard to describe how many layers there are. Like 
even when you begin with like the DNA of the people, you're talking about multiple back migrations to Africa. And so right. the, the, the DNA begins raising questions. And part of that DNA involves an unknown Semitic verbal group, probably from West Semitic, who then blends in in a way where it's not just like the males, but it's males and females. So it's on both lines. It's not like a conquering. It's like a genuine blending. My guess is, is sometime after the Bronze Age collapse in uh, around 1200 BC, but before 800 BC, because by 800 BC, you start seeing writing that, that resembles Giz or Sabaean in some way. So you see then a sharing of another Semitic alphabet script upon a language that's different than that Semitic language. And then that country decides, or that nation state that forms decides to become Christian. And so does like a throwback. And then over time, because of Christian controversies, uh, one theory of the Ethiopian Jews is that some people reverted back to Judaism as a, as a, you know, forget this type of movement, kind of how you felt in relation to fundamentalist uh, Baptists. They said, forget it. Why don't we just become Jewish? So you have all those different, like there's like four or five different layers of relation to Semitic culture mm -hmm. and Semitic identification that uh, maybe it would have confused you at that moment. And, you know, God, God works in his own mysterious <laughs> ways. So we're glad that you came when you did on, on his time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I came with like a better understanding of Oriental Orthodoxy and, um, and honestly understanding that the, that the Ethiopians aren't really Judaizers and, <laughs> um, and that, that sometimes there's cultural expressions that are different and that's okay within the church. Uh, we have no pork in any of our yeah. national dishes, and, as an and, example. And Paul, see, the thing is, what, what Paul said was, don't judge those who eat. He didn't say, hey, you have to eat pork. <laughs> 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 you have to stop being a Jew or something like that, you know? Uh, or you have to stop being Polish. And, you know, I'm of both Polish and Jewish descent. And it's like, okay, I didn't become Egyptian. <laughs> um, but anyway. Well, people will confuse that sometimes because Copt means Egyptian, right? Just in a, Right. <laughs> I usually just try to refer to myself as Oriental Orthodox because it's like, okay, I'm not really a Copt because mm -hmm. I'm not really Egyptian. <laughs> you, you said you have some uh, Indian in you as, as well. Have you ever uh, mm -hmm. gone Jacobite <laughs> or Marankara? <laughs> Honestly, if there was a closer Indian Orthodox Church, I probably would have joined the Indian Church uh, because of that connection. <laughs> uh, so uh, shortly thereafter, I uh, after kind of that time pondering the Ethiopian Church, noticing the Ethiopian Church, I uh, went to New Zealand wow. on a working holiday visa. And I was hitchhiking across the North Island when I was picked up by a Dutch reformed guy who had never picked up a hitchhiker in his life. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so he calls up his wife on the way home and says, hey, I picked up a hitchhiker. You could hear on the other end, you what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I ended up through some circumstances, spending a few days with them and their cousins and met with their minister, the minister of one of the Netherlands Reformed congregations, who gave me a Psalter. Wow. And... In what language? In English. Oh, okay. I and thought I had, it was in Dutch. I was going to say, you know Dutch too? <laughs> oh, no, Dutch is a kind of a hard language. <laughs> but I ended up uh, becoming Reformed. Mm -hmm. And I was Reformed for seven years. I got very much into Reformed theology, loved reading people like Burkhoff and Huxima and Meredith Klein. And so I went to Westminster Seminary, California, 
to study to become a reformed minister. And I was actually a pastoral intern at the, at a United reformed church in Escondido. And while I was there at Westminster, I started, I had some questions about Chalcedon. Um, now I had had a few Coptic friends for a couple of years at that point. And I actually had gone and visited one or two Coptic church, a uh, mm -hmm. Coptic church once or twice. And my thought at that point was not really conversion. My thought at that point was let's have dialogue. Cause I gained a little better understanding of what the Coptic church and the Oriental Orthodox church uh, uh, communion believed. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I knew that kind of some of the things that were said about them weren't true. So I was like, you know, there's, there's actually room for dialogue, especially with this whole connection or similarity between reformed and Oriental Orthodox theology that emphasizes that it's God coming to us, God seeking us out to save us. And so I was very interested in that. And I was kind of wondering, well, wouldn't some more Miophysite Christology work better with Reformed theology than what we have? So I wanted some dialogue. And so I started asking some questions about Chalcedon. And the answers I got were off. And so, and honestly, rather dismissive. And so that... <laughs> I'm not the kind of person who, who, if you just give me a, a quick kind of dismissive answer, just goes, oh, okay, I'll move on. That just makes me want to ask more questions. And, and yeah, and you're talking about from the reformed side, right? Because it, I would think that the whole, our whole communion would be irrelevant to them. For them, the, the mm -hmm. main debate, the crux of the debate, the big one is between them and the Latin church. Right. And then internally between all the various thousands of anglo-saxon denominations that that come out of the protestant reformation differentiating themselves am i right so it's like even thinking about us it's like oh i mean i would imagine they view us as ancient heretics like they don't even want to waste their time yeah most of them would simply dismiss the oriental orthodox churches without too much of a thought as oh they're just meophysite or oh they're just not not even realizing how big the oriental orthodox church originally was that it was originally half of christianity uh, just kind of dismiss it as oh well that's just a little group that exists over in the middle east and that leaves out so much of the actual history behind it of the nine european bishops who fled to ethiopia after chalcedon it leaves out all the difficulties that around the Council of Chalcedon itself. So I got Shenouda Ishak's book, Christology and the Council of Chalcedon. I got Father Samuel's book, Council of Chalcedon Reexamined. I got all the minutes of the Council of Chalcedon. So I'm reading this stuff and I'm like, okay. That's 1,500 pages. I had a friend, Chris Dodge, <laughs> on the program who read the minutes. You two are savage readers. It's, it's, it's big, and oh my goodness, it is a mess. And there is stuff that would make us uncomfortable too. It is just plain a mess what happened at that council. And I really have to agree with St. Severus that Dioscorus was standing alone. He was the only one who was actually standing up for the faith at that council. And um, even the Egyptian bishops might have agreed with him theologically, but they were willing to throw him under the bus um, if the council would accept from two natures as a valid statement of Christology. But when they said no, they said, oh, okay, well, we're going back to Egypt. And, and the extent to which my church history professor, who basically just twisted all of church history to make it sound like it was reformed people all along. Um, <laughs> yeah, Augustine was reformed, right? <laughs> Except for the Middle Ages. What he said was that the, the, the truth was kind of like in, with, and under, and you can find it in certain parts from Augustine till the Reformation. You can kind of find it in certain people had certain truths, like 
or from a Protestant perspective, like predestination in Gottskalk of Arbai and uh, justification in Bernard of Clairvaux. Yeah, otherwise you have to say that your theology did not exist on the earth till 1500s, and then mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit has some questions for you. <laughs> right, and he tried to argue, uh, by, with very selective reading, uh, that, that the church for the first like four or five centuries was basically reformed. And not maybe in all the details that it worked itself out after the Reformation, but that it was in the basics agreed with the reformed. Um, well, that's very problematic because, you know, I actually did the assigned reading. I read the assigned reading and I talked to some of my fellow students and they hadn't actually read the assigned reading. Uh, but I read the assigned reading and I read more than the assigned reading. And when I was posting like a couple quotes that made that kind of obvious on Twitter, my church history professor sent me this, uh, this direct message and said, hey, don't read more than the assigned reading. <laughs> don't what? <laughs> Sorry, that just puts up more red flags in my mind, right? Yeah. Um, that just raises more questions in my mind. So while I'm doing the, the reading of the early church, I'm finding very clear agreement that the Eucharist really is the body and blood of Christ, that there's what uh, St. Justin Martyr calls transmutation of the elements into the body and blood of Christ, and that baptism washes away sins, and chrismation as a necessary sacrament going along with baptism. I'm reading Cyril of Jerusalem and Ambrose of Milan, writing in the 4th century, thousand miles apart, one was a very Latin guy, one was a very Palestinian guy. Probably would have had to communicate in a, what was for both of them a second language if they had actually met in person. And yet, here they are, describing the same basic pattern of the liturgy and the sacraments. And what that does not mean is every detail was the same. It means the skeleton is the same. The form is the same. When I would try to bring this up, I found the Reformed would say, oh, well, you're just, that that's not right because there's different details in the liturgy over the century. Well, well, of course, but the same pattern is there. There's liturgy of the word followed by the liturgy of the sacrament with the Christian greeting, with uh, the anaphora, and the Eucharist is always at the center of the liturgy. And then they're both describing baptism, which has chrismation immediately afterward, talking about it being uh, an enlightening receiving of the Holy Spirit, the Eucharist being transformed into the body and blood of Christ by the authority and power of the priests. And, I mean, Protestants also love St. Athanasius, but they only really love his stuff on the Trinity and on the Incarnation. And they don't bring up things like he took the cloak of Paul the Hermit and wore it on the three primary feast days and one time threw it over a young man who had died and he rose from the dead. Or St. Athanasius talking about the authority of the priest to absolve sins. That's not very Protestant stuff, except if you consider Anglicans Protestants. And so I'm seeing all of that in the early church. I'm seeing this Christology in people like Irenaeus, Ignatius, Athenagoras, Clement, Athanasius, and I started reading Severus, too, St. Severus. So I'm reading all these saints, all these early church fathers, and I'm seeing, oh, well, they believed, they, they had this very simple Christology, God took on flesh without change, without division, and there's no, okay, it, it's, it's his divine nature doing this and his human nature doing that. It's just Jesus Christ, God incarnate, is doing all these things. We're eating and drinking the blood of God. God died on the cross for us. That's the way that they're talking. 
which is very much, yeah, it's very much the Oriental Orthodox way of talking, very Miophysite Christology. And so I'm seeing that I'm I'm studying Chalcedon, and the more I'm studying Chalcedon, the more questions I have. Like something is seriously wrong with this council. The the people who rejected the council seem to have been right. I try to bring up the questions, and the only there were just two people who really understood and what I was getting at, what I was trying to ask. And one of them was one of the elders at the Reformed Church where I was a intern. And the other one was Dr. Michael Horton. And so I was meeting with both of these guys and talking about Chalcedon and talking about my issues with it. And the the elder got me a copy of the my denomination at that time, United Reformed Church's uh, report on Eastern Orthodoxy, and uh, which was written after a student and another couple other people uh, had converted to Eastern Orthodoxy a few years back. And he, we, I read over it and met up with him again. And I was like, okay, well, uh, I said, some of this stuff, yeah, I, I kind of agree with the critiques, but but I said, there's something more. There's this other issue that I'm trying to get at that goes beyond things like intercession of the saints and um, Eucharist, priesthood, etc. And that's the issue of Chalcedon and the issue of Christology. And he understood and he was willing to talk about that and, and said, well, maybe you do just have a different view. But he said, maybe we can, maybe you can just see it as a, as a historical issue. And, you know, there was another elder at the URC church who once made a comment to me that he uh, had been visiting Turkey and seen some of the really old churches, like fourth century, and seen how they were all paneled with icons. And he said that that got him wondering, like, how early did that start? Um, when when I met with Dr. Horton, we met a few times, we talked about Chalcedon, we talked about Christology. When he saw kind of the direction I was heading Christologically, he kind of nudged me to maybe look into the Lutherans. So he wasn't like, oh, yeah, just go ahead and leave Protestantism. <laughs> Uh, but but he he was like, hey, look, take a look at the Lutherans because they do have that more unifying Christology. So, and the episode allegedly of uh, Luther looking to the Ethiopians. I, I don't know how much I buy the narrative, but I've seen it shared a lot in a lot of Christian publications. It, well, it's interesting with Luther because there does seem to be a bit of a difference between Luther himself and. The people who took over after him. <laughs> yeah. Um, Luther himself said repeatedly that he wanted to take the Reformation in the direction of Ethiopia, that the Ethiopians had preserved the purest Christianity. And I, now I know that there's questions of okay, well, who was Michael the deacon, and was he a Stephanite? But recently I found out there's even questions of were the Stephanites actually heretical, or were I they... Don't, I they, don't think they were. Right. They were friend, a monastic group. They were highly sacramental. Mm -hmm. um, the, the big thing is they had a particular shtick about prostration, mm -hmm. and even more so than prostration to the saints, the, the big issue was prostration to the emperor, mm -hmm. which, you know, if you're reading your namesake and the three youth in Babylon, you know, you, you almost instinctively <laughs> want to side with them for not bowing to the emperor in, in what feels certainly like, if not idolatry, idolatry adjacent. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and that's exactly what you said is exactly what I've been hearing recently. So it's like, okay, well. My, my, my bigger question about that narrative is, you know, Luther, like, wants to cut James out and all these other texts and has, mm -hmm. like, the smallest biblical canon. And Ethiopia has, like, the most comically big 
canon. <laughs> Eighty-one books, like, you know, I, those things seem to be intention. I, I think it's a little more complex than that, and um, so Luther did at one point kind of rip James, and honestly, Luther was fairly bombastic. He had a a very kind of. I don't know if you would call it hot, more hot-headed or more hard-headed personality, um, but he was just like would say whatever he was thinking at the moment, um, and wasn't always with the cleanest mouth. Uh, and, but there was there was one point at which he doubted the authenticity of James and called it an epistle of straw. Cause he said, Oh, this doesn't mention Christ. Cause what he was thinking is if it's canon, it's what mentions Christ is what points us to Christ. And that was the key that he was using because there, there still wasn't a solidified canon, even in the West, even like in the Latin church until the council of Trent, I believe. Well, you mean it wasn't closed, but it was, right. it it wasn't, was solid. It, it, they I mean, were, well, they weren't saying, hey, this is the list. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was in the, I mean, for that matter, in our church, it's still open technically. Like they can still mm -hmm. add to it if they wanted to. But sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's been relatively solid over mm -hmm. the ages in terms of all the lectionaries, the schedule of, of readings that you see. I mean, even talking about the Judaizing Christians. Um, from my understanding, the earliest church had diversity, like you said, but but a lot of the same rubrics. And mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, the community led by the brother of the Lord, right, as, as the scripture says, the, the bishop, James, or Jacob, was a more Judeo-friendly Christian community. Mm -hmm. And if anything, you know, it, it seems like the only place where that exists is amongst the Semitic Christians, amongst the Syriac and amongst the Ethiopians. Um, I don't know the Syriac well enough to say how many Semitic elements they have, but but certainly the Ethiopians and I would I would guess the Syriac. I've I've heard that there are a lot of Jewish elements in the in the Syriac church. Uh, maybe not the same ones as in the Ethiopian church, but the the kind of the way of thought. So I mean, yeah, sure. It's a it's a it's an open historical question. Like, what would Luther have actually done mm -hmm. if it came down to it? If there had actually been enough ability to communicate with the Ethiopian Church, and he had come to understand what the Ethiopian Church was saying in full, because even his conversation with Michael the Deacon, German wasn't going to be Michael the Deacon's first language, and. <laughs> <laughs> it, things probably were not fully communicated between them. Imagine so, the Ethiopians sending emissaries to Germany, Oriental Orthodox emissaries oh, to Germany around the Protestant Reformation. That would have made it even crazier. Can you imagine the German Orthodox Tewahedo Church? <laughs> that would be awesome. Well, the Germans did end up becoming some of the most fascinated with Giz. So I don't know if those link. There are those links, and then there are links beginning in the 1600s and 1700s, and especially from the 1800s. Um, and currently, Hamburg, Germany, has some of the hugest confluence of good scholars on earth. Hmm. It's, uh, it's a, I mean, it's there's a weird connection there because I don't think German and Goethe are related at all, and I, I don't know why, but it just it seems to be a a, num a number of individuals over the ages. Mm -hmm. keep making correspondence between those two places. Even uh, up to World War I, it was on the political end, the plotting and scheming of the British and the French that prevented an alliance between then Emperor Ethiop uh, of Ethiopia, Minelik, and Wilhel Wilhelm I, mm -hmm. uh, who was also allied with the uh, the Ottoman Turks at the time. And it, I, don't know, I don't know what it is, but yeah, it just keeps... There's this weird thing where individuals, Germanic and Ethiopic individuals, find ways of, of connecting and corresponding. And there's not always, like, sometimes the link is severed, but they mm -hmm. they relink somehow. That is amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, you know, would, would, would Luther have said, okay, 
I need to go in this direction with things like monasticism, priesthood. I need to get in communion, in full communion with them. Or would he have, you know, followed his somewhat bombastic personality and just said, nope, I'm right. I mean, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you've you've been discussing topics like this, like you said, since before your conversion to uh, Miaphysite Christianity. Um, what what has your experience been like blogging and after your conversion? What are are there any common topics or any particular topics from your your blog we should tell people too we'll, we'll plug it so people know mm -hmm. the polish miaphysite right it's polish miaphysite.wordpress.com um what are some common themes that you cover in the past couple years or are there any big big pieces or things that that get, got more feedback than others or things you, you want to highlight yeah well i would like to highlight the christology aspect because i've written a few articles on myophysite christology some of them go over like the fine details that are more uh formal one of them is emphasizing the the mystical aspect of it how it really is just a, a mystical christology and i also have a little article on saint gregory thaumaturgus and his myophysite christology and I also have an article that I've pinned on my website that is called What is Oriental Orthodoxy? And it just goes over the Oriental Orthodox churches and kind of some of the history there and the basic beliefs. So I think, you know, the, 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 the very important parts are the articles that, that emphasize what our Christology is, explain what our Christology is in simple terms, talk about what the Oriental Orthodox communion is. And those things, because we need to be clear on what we believe and on who we are, and we need to be able to express that to an audience beyond just, you know, the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Ethiopians and the Indians and the Armenians. People who grow up in those cultures, grow up in those contexts, have more opportunity. They don't always understand what their church is teaching, but they have more opportunity. And we need to be able to explain to the English-speaking world, which now includes second, third generation diaspora, but also includes the Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and Protestants and other people who we come into contact with exactly what we believe. That's right. Uh, and this is all centering around what does it mean for Christ to be both fully human and fully divine? And yeah. how does that impact such things as his incarnation or being made flesh, which of course impacts our salvation or our rescue or our deliverance. Pretty, oh, pretty <laughs> weighty topics. It affects everything. Well, and, and that's what I was realizing when I was looking into this as a, as a Reformed Seminary student. I was like, this has to do with our salvation. And with the question of, did God actually become incarnate? And if you're saying, uh, like Karl von Balen in uh, Heritage of the Fathers says, that the human and divine natures existed side by side, is that salvation? Is that even an incarnation? Can we really be, be saved? Because like St. Athanasius says, if he didn't, take what he doesn't take he doesn't redeem how is that really a taking on a flesh how is it really a him becoming man without change if we're going to say 
that the human nature is willing and doing certain things and the divine nature is willing and doing certain things, or even word it a little more nuanced and say that, that Jesus is the one doing things through his human nature, through the divine nature, that's still, is that a real union? As St. Dioscorus, I was reading, you know, on Chalcedon and um, in the minutes, St. Dioscorus, he knew what was at stake. And he said, I confess from two natures. I do not confess two natures. I'm compelled to speak rashly. My soul is at stake. He understood how serious it was. And it's hard when you're reformed, when you're committed to that church, when you're studying to be a reformed pastor to say, hey, um, am I going the right way? Or do I need to change direction here? And Dr. Horton said to me, if at the end of the day you feel more comfortable serving in a non-Chalcedonian church, then go for it. And he said they have the gospel too. And he didn't really agree with everything I was saying on Chalcedon, and he was still trying to, you know, he was still suggesting, hey, maybe just um, bring this up as a historical issue, that there are historical problems with Chalcedon, but still affirm, affirm the Reformed Confessions. But the problem was, when I studied Chalcedon, it affects the Reformed Confessions. It affects how they explain the Incarnation. And how they understand the Eucharist is they believe that Christ is still present in heaven. He's not present on the altar, but there is a real sacramental connection between the bread and wine and Christ. But the, as, we eat, as we take the bread and wine through our mouths, so if we have faith while we're doing that, then through faith we are being raised up by the Spirit to Christ in heaven and eating Christ in a spiritual manner through the mouth of faith. Well, again, that connects to, to Christology. Do the properties of Christ's humanity belong to his human nature or do they belong to Christ himself? Do they belong to the Word of God? If his human properties belong to the word of God, then his body and blood can be present in that bread and wine, hypostatically united to him. And like St. Jacob of Sarug, St. Dionysius Barcelibi, uh, Moses St. Moses Barkifa, I'll say, So it affects our salvation. It affects, is he really becoming incarnate? Is he really healing us? And that's what's important when I came to understand that Miophysite, what Miophysite Christology is saying, that it's two hypostases from, or one hypostasis from two hypostases, one nature from two natures. So a composite incarnate nature, composite incarnate hypostasis without division, without confusion, without mingling. And Not even for the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. Given for us for remission of sins and eternal life. For those who partake of it. So there just came this point. I meant like mentally, I was trying to to figure out if there was a way that I could reinterpret the Reformed Confessions and but at the end of the day I I, I just realized that I would be intellectually dishonest to the Reformed Confessions and to uh, the Christology that I had come to, the more Cyrillian Christology, that if I tried to remain where I was. And so I met with Father Carlos Ibrahim and uh, talked with him about what I believed and 
what my journey had been. And, and he said, okay, well, when would you like to get baptized? <laughs> so I was baptized a few weeks later. And that was a little over two years ago. It's incredible because most of the converts to the Ethiopian church, it's usually an appreciation of Emperor Haile Selassie, either through Rastafarianism or Pan-Africanism of some sort from the Caribbean or from the ADOS, the African descendant of slaves or the black American community in the United States. So somehow it's like, oh, these are the black Orthodox and that's what draws them. Um, and it, it's funny how the Africanness is not really what drew either you or Father Thomas for that matter, although he did later say the drums and the food kind of had the, a, a minor role, uh, which are definitely African components to the uh, Miaphysite puzzle. But both of you had this earnest yearning for the investigation of the truth mm -hmm. about the humanity and divinity of Christ. You both doggedly pursued it and were uninterested in the short and non-nuanced takes on the matter. And almost as a pure intellectual pursuit, you know, it's almost like God would torment you so that you would have no other way <laughs> but, but to then serve him in this way. And it, it's so it's so fascinating. On on a on a lighter note, while still talking about your blog, the Polish Miaphysite. Um, I remember reading one of the articles and you and I corresponding a little bit on Twitter about your article on instruments. And mm -hmm. at the same time, I know you visited us recently and what you witnessed is what some scholars would call this medieval manifestation of the good is right. That the, the older monastic part of the good is right, similar into the Byzantine tradition um, I believe it's John Mandorf who's written about this before, but the Byzantine tradition has this um, more ostentatious theatrical rite, which they baptized from the pagan version, but they have this monastic Palestinian rite, which is heavy on the Psalms, like literally Psalm reading, and then also the Psalmody, which is a, a kind of remix of the Psalms. And we see that in, in a little bit in the Coptic tradition, I think a lot of that growth has to do with the oppression of uh, being the minority group for so long after Islam rises. But in Ethiopia, um, this monastic rite exists that doesn't allow, for example, um, my grandfather's buried at a monastery called Waldaba in Northern Ethiopia. It's I think a fifth century monastery. And the practice there is they don't allow any instruments at all. And the belief is that you know instruments are worldly because they are man-made constructs, whereas the God-made construct is the the tongue or the mouth, and mm -hmm. so everything is a cappella. Uh, and yet, when you visited us, you saw not that monastic rite, but the more common, popular rite, which is called the mahalit, uh, mm -hmm. which just means song in in Ge'ez, and it's filled with instrumentation. So, I wonder. Mm -hmm. You know, if you could tell the audience about your article, and then you know, what do you what, what do you think then oh. <laughs> of the of the Ethiopian uh, right? At least this part of the Ethiopian right that you right. witnessed. It doesn't mean that everywhere in the Giz right is like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to distinguish, like, or to define exactly what we're talking about when we talk about musical instruments in the worship service, and so I think the objection, and, and see, this is a big thing in the in the Reformed world as well because a lot of the reformed are very opposed to instruments and the church of christ community in particular i know i went to a church of christ undergraduate mm -hmm. yeah and it, the church of christ as well though i wouldn't really call them reformed but i, I i'm thinking more of like the, yeah they're more revivalist you know, alexander campbell mm -hmm. yeah campbell and such but they're against instruments too but I'm thinking like more of the RPCNA and uh, certainly many individuals within all the different Reformed churches have for a long time opposed instruments in worship. And in doing so, they weren't opposing instruments at all 
or saying that it's ev always wrong to play instruments or even to have instruments accompanying hymns. But that when we're in the worship service, when we're worshiping God, we shouldn't be worshiping him in the new covenant with instruments of worship. Because those are of Moses, and they're connected to the Old Testament sacrificial law. And there's actually quite a bit of overlap between what, the, what a lot of those Reformed who are against instruments are saying, and what I would say that, that I'm, I'm basing on people like St. Clement of Alexandria and St. John Chrysostom. There'd be some uh, some different way of, of putting it, but that instruments were part of the Old Testament sacrifices, that they were specifically used in Old Covenant worship when animals were being slaughtered on the altar. And so the when there was fire involved and sound and suddenness, which is a very different aura and a very different approach than the new covenant standing in awe and reverence and silence in front of the Eucharist. Because in the old covenant, you have this type, you have this shadow. And so you need something sudden to drive you to look at the type, to look at the foreshadowing of Christ. But in the new covenant, you have the reality on the altar. You have the very body and the very blood of Jesus Christ, our God. And so you stand in awe and you bow down and worship the body and blood of Christ. And the church fathers, uh, some for more of that old covenant, new covenant distinction reason, and some more for a reason that of, of saying that instruments would lead you away from properly worshiping God into simply feeling emotions and being maybe you're being stirred up in your mind and in your body, but it's no different than being stirred up by secular music. And so what they opposed and, and, and what I'm opposing kind of on, on both of those bases in my articles on instruments is very specifically instruments being used as musical accompaniments during the liturgy. So, and, and we got to get more specific here because this is how it's you know it's interesting the terminology. So, what you witnessed was from about four a.m. to seven a.m. We call it mahalit. I don't know whether it's the equivalent of matins or vespers in the in the Greek tradition, but you know, one way you could refer to that is extra Eucharistic or non-Eucharistic liturgy. So that's where, and Father Thomas often talks about this, the solemnity and the joy. So the joy is being let, and certainly the African component in the drums, in the sistrum, which I thought was funny, I didn't get to talk about with you, but it's a, it's a tool used by the Minoans, as well as the ancient Pharaonic Egyptians. And so right. seeing us using the, the sistrum as well as the staff, I, I would wonder your thoughts on that. And, mm -hmm. and it kind of gets out of your system, but then there's this clear transition at 7 a.m. to when we begin the liturgy, more traditional places begin at 6 a.m., but whatever, we, we start at 7. <laughs> uh, the Eucharistic liturgy begins mm -hmm. at 7. And of course, as, as I told you too on the day, the first half of the Eucharistic liturgy is generic Trinitarian worship, the latter half, what, what you mentioned earlier, the anaphora, is the, the actual institution narratives. But even in the beginning of the Eucharistic liturgy, that is not the institution narrative, there are no more instruments. We have yeah. a single bell that signifies the beginning of the liturgy, um, the, the Lord have mercies, and the entrance uh, of, the, of the elements to the, to the people. Uh, so, so at those kind of specific moments, you, you'll hear a bell rung. Oh, and, and and also at the go forth catechumens portion. Mm. At those four portions, a <laughs> bell is rung. But other than that, there are no instruments. It's all a cappella. And so it, it matches the, the, the solemnity and reverence you're talking about for the Eucharist. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I didn't see any problem. I thought that there was a very clear distinction made between, okay, right now we're singing hymns and psalms. We're, we're just singing songs of praise to God. Liturgy of the word hasn't started yet. But as soon as you guys switched over to the liturgy of the word, it was like, not even going to have the staffs here. We're just <laughs> <laughs> no more instruments Net, right now. We have the liturgy of the word liturgy of the Eucharist, no musical accompaniment. Um, the Coptic church. And, and I think that, that a lot of people misunderstand the Ethiopian church and think that you guys use instruments in your sacramental liturgy, but you don't. And you have that very clear distinction. So I, I, I was not bothered at all that like the Ethiopian church is exactly in line with this um, having no instruments of musical accompaniment during the liturgy, liturgy of the word, liturgy of the Eucharist. And I think people misunderstand the Copts as well and think that we have uh, musical instruments. We don't just like you guys have a bell we do have symbols or triangles that are when properly used supposed to mark certain points in the liturgy and keep pace. They're not making rhythm. They're not making melody. They're keeping pace. And so that is not an instrument of musical accompaniment. And uh, <laughs> I mean, that that exact pace keeping used by the symbols is used for a wide variety of stuff in the Middle East. And uh, now I have I have had discussions with deacons and subdeacons in the Coptic Church, and they would agree in saying that there are some deacons in the Coptic Church who do try to use them as musical instruments but that that is not right. That's not the appropriate way. And when you look at the Armenian and Syrian churches, some of them have a piano or an organ. That was only introduced in the 20th century after the Syrian and Armenian genocide mm -hmm. um, in a lot of churches that were in the diaspora. If you go to places like the Armenian church in Jerusalem, you're not going to see instruments. More traditional Syrian churches, you're not going to see any organ or piano. So that's a very recent thing and not something that is universal. Yeah, we had our own piano controversy, particularly in my parish. But again, we never had it during the liturgy. Okay. It was never during the liturgy. Yeah, it's this is... a. Uh, it, it's fascinating and it reminds me, especially when you name the other traditions of another topic that we were talking about, which was going forward, trying to push to see if we can get more Oriental Orthodox or Aphrasiatic or Miaphysite Orthodox unity mm -hmm. going in Southern California. Can, can you talk about, you know, what that would look like what, what would your vision be for more for more unity or any unity at all other than the fact mm. just the fact that we have the potential to take communion together <laughs> right i mean we have the potential to take communion together but then when i talk to people who are in the different oriental orthodox churches it's like we've lived so long in these little bubbles in different countries that then even when uh, we all get together in the diaspora we're still in our little bubbles. <laughs> and I think that one of the main things that we need to do is have con celebrated liturgies. We need to be saying, Hey, every six months or so, we're all going to get together and we're all going to celebrate the Eucharist together. And we're going to encourage our people to visit the other Oriental Orthodox churches and have deacons go and serve. Deacons from different churches go and serve in the other Oriental Orthodox churches. 
I think that that visible display of unity would be very helpful. Like we have an Eritrean who is one of the subdeacons in our church. And that just makes it such a visible display of, of the unity of the Oriental Orthodox churches. They don't mistake him for a Nubian. <laughs> I, no, no, I, he's, he's pretty open. I mean, maybe some people thought he was Nubian, but he is pretty open about being Eritrean. Yeah, that's, that's funny. I think another effort is one of the things you studied in seminary is one of my favorite things as the uh, modern friends in the state <laughs> like to say, but uh, as, a, as a Semite, which I must compel myself and from my teacher, <laughs> uh, the Hebrew tongue, as they mm -hmm. say, uh, the Lishon, um, you learned Hebrew. Can you talk to us about the importance of having learned Hebrew and what I think is going to be a great pan-Orthodox move of your teaching Hebrew for free? So the Old Testament was mostly written in Hebrew, some of it in Aramaic, some of it in Greek, but most of it was written in Hebrew. And there, anytime there's a translation, even if it's a good translation, you're going to miss some things. To really get the depth of the Old Testament scriptures and see the beauty of Christ there, it is necessary to learn Hebrew. And when you learn Hebrew, when you read the Old Testament scriptures in Hebrew, it opens up so much more. Now, some things are not necessarily like directly tied to Christ, but they're things where when you read it in the Hebrew, you suddenly understand better something that you might not have understood in English. Like God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, what do you see? He says, I see a rod of an almond tree. You have well seen, because I am watching over my word to keep it. What? How does that connect? But it makes sense in the Hebrew. There's wordplay going on. And he says, I am, what do you see, Jeremiah? I see a shokade. You have well seen because I am shakad. I am watching over my word to keep it. So there's a word play going on. And there's so much beautiful Hebrew word play. And part of that connects to the New Testament's use of certain passages of the Old Testament to defend Christ as the Messiah are actually using Hebrew wordplay. I mean, yeah, one of my favorites is Psalm 2 or Mizmor, mm -hmm. and we say Mazmur in Ge'ez, but Mizmor, or the Tehillim. Yeah. Two. Um, here, I have it here. It's verse 4. He that sits in heaven laughs. So you can tell me in Psalm 2, Isaac is not there. But when you read the Hebrew, Yosheb Bashamayim Yitzhak. He laughs. He Isaacs. <laughs> Isaac is not just a noun, but a verb. And with Isaac being a type for Christ, these things have consequences, as you mm -hmm. said. So I'm 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 still very Absolutely. much very much a student but i'm so glad that that you're beginning to to teach people if people have any hesitance in learning hebrew mm -hmm. what words of encouragement do you have um you give a very logical reason but i think mm -hmm. some people still may have trepidation they'll say oh daniel's too smart that's why he learned it <laughs> you know <laughs> how, how can you encourage them to learn hebrew we can all learn a language uh the the, the problem is we number one we convince ourselves that we can't uh, or we have this this common urban myth that once you're an adult you can't learn a language and uh that's just an urban myth but if you tell yourself i can't do it then it's kind of like that garfield comic where where garfield is looking up into the tree and odie is sitting up in the tree and, and garfield says odie dogs can't climb trees 
or, or John said that, I guess. But then Garfield says, oh. it is amazing what one can do when one doesn't know what one can't do. So anybody can learn a language. We just have to understand how. And honestly, even a lot of courses out there don't teach you how to learn a language and don't break down how languages function. So the first thing you have to understand is how languages function. And that's what I'm going to talk about first. I'm not going to just throw everyone into Hebrew. First, we're going to talk about what is a language? How does it work? Languages are easier than you might think. And so what I would say is don't be discouraged. Don't tell yourself you can't do it. Uh, you can and it takes a bit of effort, but the reward is well worth the effort. Amen, amen, and and thank you, Tola, for all of your your time today, Chanter Daniel. Do, do you have anything else that you want to plug to send people over to, or any any sort of um, concluding remarks or final thoughts? Well, if there is anyone who would like to study Hebrew. I'm going to start the classes on September 9th, and we're going to do every Thursday, except for Thanksgiving and Christmas weeks. And uh, so just send an email to coptsreadinghebrew at gmail.com. Excellent. Coptsreadinghebrew at gmail.com. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Good to see you.